Hi everyone, let's get started. Today we'll be talking about the different strategies that we use at Instacart to reduce our Snowflake cost by more than 50%. Although Snowflake is a really powerful tool and it can execute a lot of big queries even with small warehouses, it has a reputation of getting really expensive, really fast. When many engineers and scientists start using this power, they don't realize how expensive their workloads could get and making sure that their queries run optimally is very, very important. I hope you can learn from our experience and use these tools to reduce your own Snowflake cost. Now let's start with introductions. My name is Rajpal Pariyani, and I'm an engineering manager in the machine learning organization at Instacart. Although my day job is to build systems for training and serving of machine learning models, my previous experiences leading data platform teams empowered me to understand Snowflake a lot more deeply. I'm the main point of contact to optimize the cost for machine learning payloads across Snowflake, AWS, and many other systems that our ML organization uses. I'm joined here by Scott Redding, who is our resident solutions architect for Snowflake at Instacart. He's been helping us optimize the Snowflake workflows for mine and many other teams at Instacart. So thank you, Scott. So here's the agenda for today. We'll start by looking at some statistics related to the Snowflake deployment for Instacart. Spoiler alert, it's, it's quite complex. We'll then look at the different observability measures used by us internally to understand the details of different queries. A big shout out to our amazing data platform team that set up all these systems and that allowed teams like mine to then troubleshoot and optimize their different payloads. Along with all this measurement, accountability becomes very important to make sure that there's dedicated point of contacts like me whose job is to keep an eye out for the expensive queries. We then become an extension of our data platform teams with our own pod, within our own pods, and make sure that the cost becomes a first class priority for teams while those teams are building new systems for new delightful product experiences. These accountable individuals then work with the domain experts with their, on their teams and then take action to further reduce cost. In the end, in the conclusion section, we'll then summarize all these learnings and give you kind of different tools to replicate the same thing in your own companies. Let's start by looking at the Snowflake deployment for Instacart. So at Instacart, we have more than 1,000 active users of Snowflake every day. This includes our product engineers, data scientists, machine learning engineers, analytics teams, and many more departments. To handle the demands of all those above mentioned groups, we have created more than 200 Snowflake warehouses of different sizes and that run more, more than 230 million queries per month for different automated and the ad hoc needs. That's a quarter of a billion queries a month. That's quite a lot. And we have over 260 petabytes of data queried per month by these users, and all this data is spread across 5 million active tables. We have different access control settings enforced at the database, the schema, the view, and the table level, which makes sure that only the data that is accessible for different folks can be accessed by them and no one else. Again, a huge shout out to our data platform team that maintains such a complex system. So here's a summary of our accomplishments that we've been able to achieve in the last year. First, we reduced our Snowflake cost by more than 50% in 2022 we're able to reduce our storage costs by more than 33% by deleting unused tables, backing up tables in, in long-term storage for still compliance purposes so that we still have the way to kind of reprovision them when, when it's required. We also optimize our time travel policy and finally, we use transient and temporary tables quite a lot in addition to the permanent table wherever it was possible. So using a combination of this really fine-grained measurements, data clustering, query profiler optimization, and many other optimizations that we'll be talking about today, we are able to drastically reduce our runtime for many of our queries. One such example is a query that generates features for our ML models. Once that query was optimized, we are able to get the time reduced from three hours to two minutes. So the main two prerequisites for saving cost across any infrastructure is the combination of observability and accountability. In this case study, we're talking about the Snowflake cost optimization, but we follow the same convention for all the other systems that we use, like AWS, Datadog, et cetera, et cetera. The observability done by our data platform team allows different teams like mine to understand the metrics around runtime, cost, and many other factors that we'll be talking about today. 
when you combine this with the domain expertise of those teams that are running those workloads, it really empowers them to create a lot of impact and get huge cost savings. The accountability for individuals then give, give, also gives broad mandates to people like me who will be the driving force in making systematic changes and then create customized processes which then makes it almost second nature for teams to write good, optimized queries. People often underestimate the power of ownership and accountability. So even after you spend a lot of time and effort creating the best observability metrics, the dashboards and automated alerts, you still need people to execute the changes and observe the impact of those changes. You can, however, automate a lot of these things to make sure that the work done by these accountable folks does not get boring for them. So now let's dive deeper into the observability part, right? Let's recap the details of different Snowflake warehouses with respect to the computation power that each of this warehouse size provides, along with their cost in credits per hour. So as you can see, you can go all the way from extra small all the way to 6x large, and that kind of gets progressively expensive. Snowflake does allow you to run multiple queries at the same time on the same warehouse, but you're limited by the computation power of each warehouse. The first time I used Snowflakes around like five, six years ago, I was really surprised that it was able to handle really complex workloads, even with extra small and small warehouses when compared to other equivalent systems. I also remember that the separation of compute and storage at that time in data warehouses was a total game changer. And even now, Snowflake has a big edge over other competitors. It's always better, in my opinion, to start with a really small size warehouse, extra small, run your queries, and then look at the different statistics in the query profiler. We'll be talking about a lot of those things in the subsequent slides, and what metrics do you look at in the query profiler, and also using query history and other things. Depending upon the stats in the query profiler, you have the option of either horizontally scaling your workloads, which should always be the preferred approach in my opinion. However, there are other cases when vertical scaling is the better way to save cost. We'll be talking about all those metrics in the subsequent slides. As I mentioned before, in Snowflake, you have the option to run multiple queries on the same warehouse and at the same time, the costs are calculated on the hourly level, but it becomes really, really important to separate the runtime and statistics for each of those individual queries. This allows us to then find the most expensive queries that need the most amount of attention. So when we started uh, last year, our data engineering team painstakingly developed the code and the system to do this. Uh, again, a huge shout out to them. Uh, this enabled teams like mine to look into the details of those queries and also look at the information about the cost, the runtime, and all those things. We haven't published our own source code yet for that, uh, but uh, we have also linked an open source DVD package that can do the same thing for your own deployment. I think the slides should be available after the session, so you should be able to click all these links and get the statistics that you see on the right side. So as, um, once you figure out the deployment details of, those at that, of that DVD package, you'll get the schema that is highlighted on the table on the right side. Some of the things in that table that get used quite a lot internally are the query ID, the byte scan, the credits, et cetera. You can use the query ID for a more detailed investigation in the query profiler that will be covered later in the presentation. So in addition to the cost per query table, we also developed a query tagging system which uses simple JSON objects to add the system, stakeholder, and teams as the required field for all our Snowflake queries. No matter what system is executing them, it's always required that you pass these on. If you don't, then obviously there'll be alerts triggered and you'll be asked to add them, right? The owners all have also the option to add other optional fields just in case they, they, these different teams want to add more attributes about their own queries and their own system. We then use the parse JSON function to extract the values from their field at the time of ETL. And then finally, the query tags and the cost per query table allowed us to get really fine-grained information about the areas that needed tuning and cost reduction. Here's another technique we use initially to identify the same kind of queries that run across different dates. In the box here, you'll see the function for query fingerprinting that we use. This query fingerprinting was really useful for us at the start to remove the different attributes like dates in the where clause uh, so then we can filter through all that noise and find the queries that need the most amount of attention. You can also then use this fingerprinting 
queries to get the most expensive and the frequent queries that Scott will be talking about at a later time. This, as, however, as a query tagging that I spoke about became more prevalent across different distributed pillars at Instacart, we achieved the same thing using query tags. So a combination of this fingerprinting and the query tags in the future could really help you kind of find out where the problem areas for your system are. Now let's talk about the accountability part of this, right? As I said before, it is very important to assign DRIs, which is an acronym for direct responsible individuals that could allow you to do the tuning and optimization in parallel across your organization. That becomes very important for a large organization like Instacart. I mean, not very, very large, but still it is enough kind of queries and the scale that we talked about that you definitely need parallel execution and parallel tuning and optimization of your workloads. As I mentioned before, each of these DRIs, so I'm one of the DRIs for machine learning org, have the authority to add more tracking for their queries, right? And your system could be extensible by using that query tag that I mentioned before. And again, it can provide you more fine-grained information for the observability part that you want. Uh, I was a DRI for the machine learning pillar, and I work very closely with my team members, the data engineering team, and Scott here from the Snowflake Solutions Architect team to optimize the queries that generate features for many of our machine learning services. It's also really important to assign budgets for each of these pillars so that they can use this as a guiding beacon for controlling current and future cost. We use certain factors like past year's usage, anticipated percentage in business growth, each of those pillars' contribution to the business growth, and growth in the number of people and applications in that org to get that forecast for each individual organization. If you cannot get into the forecast, uh, that gets scrutinized a lot by the cost leadership team that we have. And in the worst cases, if we need more money than the forecast, which we try not to do, then those cases get escalated all the way to the engineering leadership, and then we kind of go do different things to adjust the forecast accordingly. So here's a couple of charts that you see, which we look at almost on daily, the daily level, which is the daily spend uh, with the forecast uh, of the green line and then the actual usage in the blue line highlighted here. We looked at these statistics very, very closely, and especially if any of the automated alerts that we have get triggered, if any of, let's say, certain days or certain weeks of usage goes above the forecast at a level that we are not comfortable with, right? Then the accountable DRIs get into the action board and start analyzing the cost uh, and the causes of this cost increase in a lot more details, right? Using the tools that we'll be describing later. Then they used tools like Query Profiler to analyze all those problematic queries and then get the cost uh, in line. It's also important for you to kind of look at the usage level by each warehouse. That also gives you more information about if there's a particular amount of warehouse which is the most problematic. Is there any kind of tuning that you need to do for that warehouse? So the warehouse spend per day is also very, very important and something that we look at day to day on a day to day level. Now let's move on to the talking action part, right? Where you'll be learning about the different tools that you can add to your arsenal. So workload optimization is very, very important and the key for cost and performance optimization. For each of these queries to run optimally, it is very important to run it on the optimally sized warehouse. And some of the metrics that can help you find that are the query runtime, the byte scan, the data spilling, et cetera, that you can get uh, using the query history Snowflake view. We also add this information in our cost per query table so that everything is available in one place. Scott will be talking about all these metrics in a lot more detail in the subsequent slides, but the high level kind of guidance is you should minimize the byte scan by using the combination of filtering and clustering, and you should uh, avoid kind of spilling onto the slower storage like remote S3 and stuff and by selecting an appropriately sized warehouse. I'll now pass it on to Scott uh, where he can give you more details about those tools. Thank you. So uh, as Raj has said over the course of this presentation, I think the, the big piece of, of what we've done is that we have gone down to the cost per query level, right? And, and using these functions to look at how, like what your, your warehouse is costing you the most money and then drilling down into the queries running on that warehouse and tagging those queries to individual DRIs is the most important thing um, and making them accountable. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go run through, like once you've figured out where your expensive queries are, go through some query profile information and, and what to look at. So um, one of the things we talked about was the query fingerprinting. 
Query fingerprinting is really important because you can you can track your DAGs over time. You can track your multiple pipelines over time. Like usually you'd run in a query for the next hour and then another hour and then another hour. And those queries IDs would be different. And even if you did the SQL hash of that query, that would be different. So unless you query do a query fingerprint, that way you can track that DAG over time or use query tagging. That allows you to group all of those costs up to a single pipeline. Um, I think that's the key piece of what we do with query fingerprinting. And then from that query fingerprinting, like here's a formula we've used, uh, which is assigning a weight to the query, right? You just sum the credit hours times the execution time, and then use that weight to basically categorize or group queries into your most expensive queries and your most frequent queries. So once you have that, those queries set, um, you can drill down in the specific warehouse to look at those detailed metrics. Um, here's an example of one of our SnowSide dashboards that, that show that information. Um, so you can show average job execution um, on the right over there with the big spikes. That's something you want to look at. If your average runtime is going up really, really high, then there could be some contention on your warehouse. Um, that could be a, a spot where you want to focus on. So all of these dashboards of the observability piece of this is trying to identify where to look or what to go after, like what's the big bucks you know, to, to go after. Bottom left is your multi-cluster warehouse scale out. Um, it's also something to look at, which is it shows you know, how many clusters spin up at certain times of the day um, so that you know how, how much you're scaling out or how fast things are scaling out. Um, that's important to see if, if, you know, if you have high spikes in average runtime and you're scaling out to all of your clusters, you could be having a lot of contention on a warehouse that's taking up all of the warehouse and making you spin up more clusters than you would want to at a certain time. So you look at that. Uh, a really important one is the middle one, queries bucketed by runtime. So as we've gone through this workload optimization is key. Um, what you wanna do, uh, I think more in, in the Snowflake marketing and sales, you'll see, you know, hey, it, it, which is awesome, have a separate warehouse for marketing, have a separate warehouse for your finance team for this team, that team, and the other team, and suddenly you have so many warehouses that are severely underutilized, it's kind of a bad approach to do that. So that's why we preach workload optimization. So take a specific workload. So in this middle section, you can see of this specific warehouse, there's like 800,000 queries running in less than a second. So those are small queries, they run fast. Those queries should be grouped together. So when you look across a warehouse and you see on the bottom, when there's you know 100 or so queries running for more than an hour, those probably are a different type workload that shouldn't be on this warehouse. Either you need to optimize those queries to get them to run faster on this warehouse or move them to a bigger warehouse. So that's the key. Um, the other metric on the, which is a super important one that shows contention and if you're undersizing your warehouses, obviously is spilling. Um, remote and local spilling uh, is, a, is a huge, especially remote spilling is a, a huge slowdown of your queries anytime you spill to remote is a bad thing so those are super important metrics to track um, here's a more detailed drill from some of those where it actually shows um, that type so when we categorize an expensive query on the left um, you can see the warehouse it ran in total times run um, so just group these queries together so that you can see which ones to go after oh frequent queries also uh, it's not up here but frequent queries are kind of a something people miss, you know, that because you can't query, most people don't query fingerprint, but there, there could be a query that runs really fast, but it runs, you know, 10,000 times a day. And if you group that up 10,000 times a day, you know, and it only costs you a couple bucks, but 10,000 times a dollar is still $10,000 a day. So frequent queries can get, like they can fly under the radar and cost you a lot of money. So you need to look at frequently ran queries as well. Okay, so once you identify where to go, what, what do you look at? So query profile is, is where you go um, in the Snowflake world to figure out, you know, is a query running quickly? Um, this is something I, I think maybe bigger customers like Instacart can see. Um, maybe smaller customers never really see this as much, but it's something to note. If you see in the query profile where you go step one, step two, and if you see a step jump to over into the thousands, it actually means that it the warehouse probably ran out of memory or that query exploded a join, um, did something where it was taking up too many resources on the warehouse and that job was killed and restarted. When it restarts, it'll restart in a step 1000. So whenever you see that, that's definitely an indicator that either that query is run on a small, too small of a warehouse or 
that query needs to uh, move away from other queries. Like for instance, if you ran like two huge ML pipelines on the same warehouse and they all jumped in at the same time and they contend for resources, um, they could, one of them could be killed um, that way. So that's definitely something to look at. Uh, the question was, can you qu programmatically query for finding queries that uh, have done that, have that step? And it doesn't really show up in query history, unfortunately. But when you look at, it would be a long running query that you would flag and then look in query profile and see this. Maybe more voices would get that prioritized. Yeah. It's something, yeah, we should show, but uh, right now we don't. There's a lot more features coming, as you heard in the keynotes, warehouse utilization metrics, cost per query metrics are coming in private preview as well, like an official cost per query table. So um, we're, we're heavily innovating in this area to make this stuff easier. So um, I think we have plenty of time, so I'll take that question now. It is important for you to have certain people whose job is it to look at this a lot more closely and then only involve other people as needed, mm. right? Uh, within my organization, I and then there's one more person that kind of spends a lot of time looking at this. And the automated alerts also make it very simple, right? So you don't have to actually go look at this every day. The, if the automated alerts get triggered, you can obviously adjust the priority there or maybe the, the granularity there uh, and that kind of makes it easier for us. So it's, it's not that you need a huge team of people, but yes, to some have some accountable people that can then make this flow across different other people as, and require, and involve them as required kind of goes a long way. Right? It, there, there's an automated message that also goes to different yeah. teams uh, and different kind of people. And then there's other tools and kind of documentation that each of those people can use that is highlighted in our wiki and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's a key piece we haven't really shown, but uh, we have so lots of integrations in Slack, so it's all automated. If a if a your budget if you go over budget, there's instant Slack matches to that team's DRI's Slack channel um, to tell them they're over budget or they're trending up or they're trending down. We have uh, query failures. If query failures are causing well, lots of credits to to be chewed up, um, that also alerts. So there's quite a bit of alerting that does that's automated. So the query fingerprinting thing that we mentioned before actually takes away all these details for you, right? The fair clauses, the filters, and all that. It takes away the new lines, et cetera. That is a good way for you to kind of do this, exact of this function. And then the query tagging also kind of goes a long way in identifying those queries for you, right? So then we look at the query ID, look at the cost per query table, look at the different attributes like the, the partition scanned and all those things that we kind of maintain. And then if that also doesn't give us enough information, go to query profiler. Is query profiler does give you all this in a more UI based form, right? So the most complex queries and the most expensive queries definitely go through that query profiler quite a lot, right? That analysis. So the query tags would still be the same for those queries, even if they are run at a different time, right? And then you can take, just take one of the query IDs and then go look at the reason why it kind of went. And if you solve that problem, that query, it will then automatically do the, solve the same problem for all your subsequent runs of the same kind of query, right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll get on <laughs> the rest. Um, so most expensive nodes um, this is the the profile where you look to see um, where to attack a query so in regards of, of how do you fix these things or where do you go after these things uh, the actual profiler will show you your most expensive nodes and what to go after to make a query run better right so um, in this case yeah, there's an aggregate here that's taking up a lot of time um, when you see aggregates like this taking up a lot of time, there could be a join explosion. So that's one thing to look at on the query profile. You'll see, you know, 100,000 rows coming in on one side, 100,000 coming on the other side to a join with, you know, a billion rows coming out of it, like a full Cartesian project, a product or a partial Cartesian. Then you aggregate back down or do a select distinct after that. Ag those aggregates will take a long time. So that's something to look at um, to figure out to make sure you're, you're meaning to do a Cartesian. Um, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, table scans is what we're going to get into a little bit as well. Um, table scans are usually the most expensive part of a query. Um, so you want to look at those and how to optimize those. And we'll get into some of the techniques here for that. Um, I did want to say like for table scans, large CTE queries, uh, I always say filter early and filter often, right? Even if you think you filtered in a CTE, you don't need to filter in a subsequent CTE. 
might as well do it. Just, just give Snowflake all the information we need to filter as much as possible and push those filters down to a table scan. Because filters could be applied either in the table scan itself or it could be a post-join filter. Post-join filters obviously take longer to run than an actual push-down filter that eliminates partitions out of the query completely. The next session in, in profile overview. Profile overview shows kind of high level. We'll kind of go through this. It'll show you where the processing CPU is your problem. Remote disk is a big one to look at. Synchronization and initialization. So on this query specifically, remote disk is high. That's kind of a red flag. You probably show spilling on this query because spilling is spilling to remote. And when you spill to remote, you're, you're constantly writing back to S3 or your blob store, depending on which cloud provider you're in. So that's something to look at. Synchronization and initialization time it is all the time set up to like pull the nodes up, start the nodes, and any synchronization. So as we run queries in parallel, we're constantly moving data between nodes and syncing that data between the nodes so that they can execute the next operator in the query plan. So if you see this, there's not much you can do about this, but I want to flag it because a lot of the times if it's a lot of your query, sometimes it indicates that your warehouse is too large, right? It takes a lot of time to spin up like 128 nodes, right? If in a smaller smaller warehouse, it takes less time to synchronize and, and do that and initialize and synchronize. So sometimes it's better to run on a smaller warehouse as long as the, the data is enough to run on that smaller warehouse. Big ones to look at. So like I was saying with byte scanned, byte scanned is an important metric. That's kind of your leading indicator on warehouse size. The more bytes you scan, the more nodes are better because each node is, th these bytes scanned are spread across all of the nodes and all the where and that warehouse. So you can execute quickly and churn through a lot of data, the more nodes you have. So one thing I would say, make sure you optimize the existing warehouse as much as possible. Optimize your queries before just scaling up. As Raj said, vertically scaling, is good sometimes horizontally scaling is probably better but when you vertical scale you double your cost instantly so unless you can half that runtime then you're spending double the cost for no reason unless you have slas to meet then it could be a good thing and here's kind of one of the ways we size warehouses um it's kind of a overview of what warehouse size would probably be better i'm actually presenting later on thursday at 10 30 a.m as well and I have also another way to do this on micropartition size, but we tend to see if you're scanning less than a gig of data, you shouldn't usually go over a small, maybe a medium will help, greater between 20 and a gig, then you have kind of a range there. Unfortunately, you kind of have to run it and test it <laughs> and kind of see what the optimal warehouse size is for cost or your SLAs. Um, but this is kind of the general range of where you should be looking on a query. So if it's greater than 50, gigs of data, then a large and, and larger should be where you look at initially. As a note though, each, this is a significant factor, but watch out for if you're doing significant order buys in a query, or if you're doing a Cartesian explosion, right? As I mentioned before, if you Cartesian explode, you're only scanning a gig of data in the table, but you're creating hundreds of gigs of data when you explode a join. So when that explosion happens, then those extra nodes will help you as well. So watch out for that if you do need to do a Cartesian product. All right, statistics continue. Caching. So caching helps a ton with Snowflake's queries. This is all usually based on when queries run, they cache all the data in your warehouse. And when they that data is cached, then other queries can use that cache data without having to go all the way to S3 storage or blob storage. Uh, the better the the more the cache the better right whenever you see this percentage scans from cache when it's high that's great that's perfect and what how it works from left to right snowflake will check the metadata to see if that the data is in cache or not there's two caches one is query results cache and the other is warehouse cache so if it determines that the metadata is this query is already run within the last 24 hours and no data has changed then it'll re query it'll return from results at cache which is instantaneous and costs you zero money basically unless the caveat to that but basically zero money and then if it query results cache it doesn't have it in results already then it'll go to the warehouse cache uh, warehouse cache will invalidate um, as soon as a warehouse is suspended so this is where you have to watch your uh, your auto suspend time i think in general your auto suspend time usually should be pretty low 
depending on your workloads, BI warehouses, maybe you should have an, a higher auto suspend so that you can reuse that cache more often. But in general, where at Instacart especially, we have really, really low where, uh, warehouse suspend times. And it's mostly because their jobs run so often anyways, <laughs> the, ca the warehouse barely ever suspends anyways. And when it does, it needs to suspend because nothing's going to run for another hour or so anyways. Next, bytes spilled. So bytes spilled is a, is a big one. As I said, any spilling to remote storage is, is really bad um, and it's slow. Spilling to local is fine. Um, it's still fast SSDs, no big deal. But remote spill is a problem. Remote spill can either, it can be two things, either remote spilling because of contention in the warehouse where you have too many big jobs fighting for resources. They could cause Snowflake to spill to remote or just the query is too big in general for that warehouse. So again, before you just vertically scale out of nowhere, make sure that query is running efficiently and effectively. Make sure your wear filters are where they are. Make sure the filtering is being pushed down to table scans. Don't just vertically scale. That's where people get in trouble. It's the easy thing. It's the easy button, right? It just, uh, this query is taking too long. Just make it a bigger warehouse. Uh, well, but you doubled your cost. So just well, watch out for that stuff. Next one. Partition scan and partitions total. So this is where tables table scans come into play. When I'm talking about pushing a filter down to a table scan, that's where these partitions are being pruned out. So your partitions total is your total number of partitions in the entire query plan. Your partitions scanned are the number of partitions that are actually read into the warehouse. You want this number to be as the ratio as high as, you, as possible, right? You want to scan the least amount of micro partitions that you can. So some things to look out for is filtering, push downs. Like I said, filter early and often in your CTEs. Make sure that stuff is pushed down. And then if those filters are being pushed down and you're not seeing elimination of partitions, then you need to look at clustering. I think a lot of people have talked to, there's a lot of uh, good blog posts, even from select.dev, who's here, <laughs> about um, clustering. Uh, so and uh, that open source DBT package, actually, since I see them here, is actually the select.dev open source package. So take a look at that, but that's, that's the main thing. Clustering will cause those partitions to be eliminated on the filters pushed. So make sure you get your clustering correct. And that's a whole nother talk on how to do clustering accurately and effectively, but. All right, storage, storage this is your second step. Storage is cheap, right? Storage is cheap in, in Snowflake, but um, at the scale of Instacart with multiple petabytes of data, it's not cheap. <laughs> so make sure you use, like we've said, use transient tables where you can. That eliminates fail-safe, which does save you quite a bit of money at that scale. So make sure you use transient tables. Time travel, make sure it's set correctly and often. The, the last one is clones. Clones, um, although zero copy cloning is just a warning, zero copy cloning, you don't, you're not actually copying the data, you're not replicating the data, but do watch and over time. You basically have locked pointers on the micro partitions where you snapshot at that table. So as that base tab table that you clone gets further and further away from that snapshot, we are holding on to those older micro-partitions as much as possible. So the further you would get away from that base table in your clone, you are starting to accumulate costs. And you can see that in table storage metrics, you'll see retained by clone bytes. So watch out for that. Now that's something, that's a big one we did with Instacart was just recreate the clones and, and it saves a lot of storage and time travel on clone. Here's some useful links. Some great blog posts, I think, from Tej. Uh, so I don't know if people follow him on Twitter and LinkedIn and et cetera, but he's a great Snowflake customer and some other links for you guys. So I'll throw it to Raj for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. So I hope you learned a lot of useful things that you can take back for your own cost optimization journey. But let's now summarize all that we learned. So Snowflake isn't as expensive to use if you know how to do the right things, right? Uh, in fact, through this exercise, we found out that using the techniques mentioned in this presentation, we're able to run our queries much faster compared to some other peers in this domain. Right? By using the cost per query table that has a millisecond level usage of your query, the query attribution using query tags, and then building models to track the spend and make it visible to your DRIs goes a long way. And using those query performance heuristics, you can really reduce your Snowflake cost. The accountable DRIs allows you to maintain that momentum for cost optimization and future increases in costs that would be caught much later in the life cycle of queries. So cache them early, fix them early is the best way to reduce this cost, right? 
Finally, it's really helpful to have the help of experts uh, in your form of your own data engineering team, experts and the Snowflake professional services to get very big wins in this effort. Uh, for us, we were able to get almost a 40x return on your investment by having, having Scott kind of help us with many of our questions. And on behalf of Instacart and Snowflake, we would really like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much.